Okay, so it's a pleasure for us to have today Bill Bialik to make a presentation about, uh, he'll be talking about critical biological systems, but Bill is a guy that has been a pioneer in the field of physics of living systems, biological physics. Uh, I know him for a long time since I was a graduate student. He was a postdoc at KITP. That's the first time we met. Uh, at that time, both of us were working on protein dynamics and uh, Bill left the field before I did. I was still doing some of that, but then he moved into other areas. But it's important to remember that uh, he's one of the few people that got into biological physics straight into biological physics. He's not someone that's doing condensed matter or some other kind of physics and got a converter. And I, I belong to the same group, being a student from Hopfield, so I want to remember that he, he came in, in, into that direction. During these many years, we have been very, very interested on the idea of the difference between biophysics and biological physics. And the idea here is that uh, it's not only the way that you use uh, theoretical physics to understand biology, but you use biology as the paradigm of complex systems to understand new physics. So it's really a two-way road. And uh, he has done a lot of work into that direction. Notice that as you get to complex systems, the systems far from equilibrium situation like that, basically the theoretical physics is not even there in place. So you have developed that. So that makes especially important for ICANN, where you really want to have these two-way roads in a sense that's basically physics influencing uh, biology, but also the same way biology uh, explaining physics. Uh, like I told you guys, I met him, Bill starts as a graduate student at Berkeley, uh, went to Holland for some time, and then he was a postdoc in Santa Barbara when we had a chance of getting together and writing a few papers. From there, he went to Berkeley as an assistant professor, but in a, and, uh, and we continued to work together, including for a couple very interesting months in Brazil. And then he decided that uh, he had lived too many years in California, it was time to become a New Yorker. And, uh, and he moved to NEC and he was in the New Jersey area, the Princeton area, that he stayed there for a long time. And uh, at NEC, he did a lot of work, a lot of the work in neuroscience, particularly the work on flies and, and, and uh, how they function. And he put a great experimental group together with a theoretical group, it was a great time at NEC on, on new areas into neurophysics. Uh, when NEC died down, he moved back to Princeton and uh, has been one of the key people running the biological physics program in Princeton and the new generation running there. There are a lot of new people basically uh, right there like, and uh, Bill is, 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 is in there. But he also started an enterprise in New York at CUNY where he's there trying to do some new areas of bring, uh, bringing some visitors and senior people into this area in New York. Uh, uh, more recently, is one of the co-directors of uh, a physics frontier center the, that basically in, that covers the area of physics of living systems. I think by now, his center, my center, the only two survivors into this area, the physics frontier centers, and the interface of physics and biology. But it has done a great work being, bringing the community together. And more recently, it has been very interested on this idea of info, information theory coupled to physics and how you look the limits of these things and, uh, and how these things get related to ideas on phase transition. So I think that gets really into the spirit of this meeting. So with that said, Bill, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jose. Um, it's always a little scary to be introduced by old friends. You never quite know what they're going to say. So that, thank you, that was nice. Um, <laughs> I, I think I met peers around the same time, right? If I'm remembering all the sequence. So yes. Uh, yeah, we've all known each other a while. Um, I'm going to try and keep the the chat open and see if I can um, manage to notice when things get posted. Uh, if not, Pierce, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, and uh, I don't know if I can do that and the hand raising thing all at the same time. Um, so maybe uh, I actually there is a way. To... I'll, I'll interrupt if you miss something. Okay, good. Yeah, let me let me rely on that. Okay, so um, thank you. Uh, let me plunge in um, and make a kind of obvious remark, which is that there's, you know, in a community of people who are interested in 
complex adaptive matter, whatever, whatever that might mean, um, uh, perhaps something a little different for each of us, uh, it's obvious that there's something special about living matter. Um, and uh, one way to say this is that if you try to give a theoretical description of some piece of the living world, you can always think about your description as belonging to some larger class of models. And um, the particular systems that you actually find in nature are uh, only uh, special examples drawn out of that larger class. And in some way, what distinguish the, that larger class is presumably realizable um, in, in, in ways that are not as interesting and as amusing as what we see in the living world. And so in some ways, saying what's different about, about life is saying where we are in that large space of possibilities. So you could think, for example, about um, the difference between randomly connecting neurons in a network and a real brain. Um, and presumably, the random network won't really do anything terribly interesting, although actually that's a whole subject unto itself, so I should be careful there. Um, whereas, you know, real brains, they remember things, they compute things, they do all sorts of things. So, um, you know, sort of putting your finger on, on what's special um, is, is one way of, of sort of trying to get at what's the essence of uh, these living systems from the point of view of a physicist. Um, this is, of course, a ridiculously ambitious uh, phrasing of the problem, right? Um, and so uh, it's useful. On the other hand, it's, it is motivating. So uh, one example that I like, um, which uh, some of the people in the room have actually worked on, is the very specific case of, of, of thinking about proteins. I'm not going to talk at length about this, but I think it's useful just uh, to orient you. Um, and that is to, uh, to uh, you know, you think about proteins, they're, they're heteropolymers of amino acids. There's 20 different kinds of amino acids. Um, the typical length of a protein can be order 100 or a couple of hundred, although there are examples of very short ones and very long ones. Now, we know that if you make a model of a random heteropolymer, that is to say you choose the sequence of amino acids at random and you have some notion that when amino acid of type alpha is in close physical proximity to amino acid of type beta, they have some interaction uh, V alpha beta, which falls off if you pull them apart and the whole thing is connected together in a chain. Well, you can imagine how one makes this, uh, this model. The important point of having different kinds of amino acids is that the, the interactions V alpha beta are different for the different pairs alpha and beta. Well, okay, look, if you choose sequences at random, what you end up with is something glassy. It doesn't actually fold into a well-defined state like real proteins do. Um, so we know that if you were sitting out here and you chose the, the ensemble of amino acid sequences completely, completely at random, then um, you would not make functional proteins. These are not the molecules you actually find in nature. On the other hand, if you take one of the molecules that you actually find in nature and start tinkering with it and changing the sequence, you often find that the structure into which it folds doesn't change at all. So that tells you that it's not, it's also, you're also not at the other end where the exact sequence matters, right? So I think that, that you know, there was once upon a time a view in which this is what biologists might have thought and this is what physicists would have thought, right? Some of you are old enough to remember the idea of replacing a complex system with a random system. Um, and then, you know, the biologist telling you in response, no, 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 but there are all these details and they all matter. The thing that I think is wonderful about the, about the, the amino acid sequence problem is that we know that neither limit is correct. Um, we know it both experimentally and theoretically. Um, and uh, so real life, there's a non-trivial question of characterizing this distribution. And you realize that, you know, 100 is not infinity, but of course with 20 different kinds of amino acids, um, the space of possibilities here becomes very, very large. And at least uh, notionally, there's some n goes to infinity limit in which these probability, the, our description of these probability distributions breaks into different phases. And so you can ask, you know, what's the phase diagram of, of, uh, of possible proteins and, and where do we find um, the real ensemble in this, in this phase diagram? And so it's that spirit of question that I want to carry into more complex settings. Um, so this notion of, well, where am I in the phase diagram? It's not, it's not the big question of, you know, what distinguishes life from non-life. We've already narrowed down a little bit. Um, many of you will know that uh, 
that there's a an old uh, thread in uh, our community defined broadly that goes back uh, to Per Bach uh, in the 80s, um, where you know there was this idea that that of course the most interesting place to be in a phase diagram is is at, at some critical point or 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 on a critical surface. So maybe there are ways in which non-equilibrium systems organize themselves to these critical points in some generic way. Um, and, and Pear had a very, um, shall we say, encompassing view of how this idea was going to, um, was going to change how we think about the world, um, which was articulated in this book for a general audience, which he wrote um, near the end of his sadly shortened life. Um, uh, well, whatever you might think about all this, I mean, you know, as, as uh, with all visionaries, surely he went too far. Um, but on the other hand, he did stir things up in, in, in very interesting ways, um, uh, subject for, for historians, I suppose. Um, there, there are more modest but more concrete results on this issue of whether biological systems organize themselves uh, near to a critical point. And I give you three examples. Um, one is drawn from observations on patterns of activity in populations of neurons. Uh, in, this, in this original case, uh, in uh, little pieces of brain which have been taken out and put in a dish and kept alive, uh, where you can do certain kinds of experiments um, um, very thoroughly. Um, and you see uh, patterns of activity that are actually very much reminiscent of the sort of avalanche type dynamics that was at the beginning of the ideas of self-organized criticality. Completely different is to look at the behavior of the membranes that, that are the boundaries of all cells. And it turns out, so people have been studying the, the, the phase behavior of membranes for generations. This is one of the classical examples of, of you know, the application of physics to biology. Um, and somewhere in the aughts, it became clear that people had missed a huge part of the story, um, which is that real biological membranes are strongly, are, are very much multi-component systems. And so of course they have much more interesting phase diagrams um, even if they keep, even if the phase diagram is not a, a changing geometry, which was the thing that most people were focused on, even in their planar geometry, they have a very interesting and rich phase diagram. And uh, what's astonishing is that um, critical points in the phase diagram of the composite in the composition plane um, are actually very close to the operating points of real membranes. And, and this has consequences for your ability to observe fluctuations, or critical slowing down, all of the wonderful things that we associate with critical points, um, you can actually see in, in real biological membranes. Um, and I think this is actually very beautiful and, and to some extent underappreciated work. In particular, showing that some things that people might have thought were um, sort of specially organized structures might just be um, the, the, the large droplets that you get uh, from fluctuations in systems that are near to criticality. Um, a very different direction, and by the way, this is interesting because this is a system that's actually close to thermodynamic equilibrium, presumably, um, in contrast to, to, to the nervous system. Um, going back to strongly non-equilibrium systems, um, one has these beautiful observations from the group in Rome on uh, the correlation structures of fluctuations and the velocities of birds in a flock, where again you see uh, sort of long range correlations and fluctuations, the kind of scale free behavior that's very much reminiscent of critical behavior. So these are just three examples. Um, uh, and as you can see, all sort of post 2000, so in the last couple of decades. Um, and, and there's more, and they're a bit scattered. So, you know, the literature on neurons doesn't talk very much to the literature on membranes, which doesn't talk very much to the literature on. Uh, on, um, on collective animal behavior, uh, but there are sort of parts of the physics community have been interested in all of these things. Um, uh, in addition to uh, being a little bit enthusiastic and telling you that there are interesting examples all over the place of this sort of hints at the approach of real biological systems to criticality, uh, let me remind you um, that you should be careful about these things. Um, uh, again, some of you will be old enough to remember um, the excitements about one over F noise. Um, indeed, uh, self-organized criticality was originally proposed, uh, at least in the, the title of the original paper, as possibly a, an explanation for, for one over F behavior. Um, 
it, it is possible that in some systems, what one sees as one of the ubiquitous one over F noise that one sees has some deep theoretical explanation. Um, but unfortunately, there's also an incredibly boring um, explanation, which is that uh, if you take uh, many processes happening in parallel that all have a correlation time, but the distribution of correlation times is broad, you will get something that looks an awful lot like one over F behavior, looks scale invariant. Um, and, and of course, in a, in a solid where you're measuring uh, electrical conductivity or the current fluctuations that are associated with fluctuations in the electrical conductivity, there's a natural mechanism for a broad distribution of time scales because trap the coming carriers coming out of their traps is a thermally activated process. So as long as the distribution of barriers is broad compared to KT, the distribution of time scales will be very broad indeed. And you can easily get things that look approximately one over F like. And if you want, the lesson of all of this is that um, there's a very important difference between being approximately scale invariant and being exactly scale invariant, which is I think something that, that uh, we all know, um, but it really matters, right? Um, and uh, in, in the literature on, on one of ref noises, there's a beautiful review article by Dada and Horn from many years ago that I can recommend to you, um, actually before the self-organized criticality paper, which um, one might worry about, uh, it, which emphasizes that, that you can uncover uh, the, what's hidden under here by changing temperature. And so for example, if you plot over a range of temperatures, um, what should be a constant if you really had one over F noise, and in particular, a number which should be the same at every frequency if you had um, uh, one over F noise, if you had true one over F noise, um, you can sort of unfold um, these small deviations um, from true scale invariant behavior. Um, and uh, as always, beware of log log plots. Um, so, uh, so on the one hand, um, there are lots of different areas in the living world where you're seeing signs of things that remind us of the behavior of systems near a critical point. On the other hand, we know that there are grave dangers associated with pointing to these things and saying, oh, look, you know, uh, that must, it must be critical. Um, and and uh, unfortunately, this is compounded by the fact that I, I would say the, the amount of space in journals that's devoted to why biological systems being organized to a critical point would be a good idea or would be something that evolution would select for or would just make us happy, um, that volume greatly exceeds the volume devoted to showing that it's actually true. Um, and so the, the literature is a bit of a mess, although on the other hand, there's lots of wonderful things in it that you might try to ferret out. So what I'm gonna do today um, is um, to talk about two examples um, one of which is a genuine, is a near equilibrium problem, and one of which is not. Um, one of them is drawn sort of from the heart of the molecular events that are happening in all cells all the time, um, which is the, the, the regulation of the reading out of information um, that's encoded in the genome. And the other is from the dynamics of, of large populations of neurons. Um, so let me um, dive into these two examples. Um, so in order to talk about the problem of apparent action of distance in, in gene regulation, let me uh, actually uh, try and sketch something for you. Um, so uh, just a, a few minutes of experimental facts. Um, all of the cells, to, to a very good approximation, all the cells in your body have the same DNA. The reason that different cells are doing different things is that they're reading out different parts of it. Um, so if you imagine that somewhere along the DNA, you have the gene that codes for some particular protein, protein number one, the way this information uh, gets read out, as, as many of you know, is that there's some large molecular complex, which includes, for example, the RNA polymerase, which is an enzyme that is going to walk, literally walk along um, the DNA molecule and it will spit out its tail end, a little piece, which is called messenger RNA. And that eventually goes to the ribosome where it gets translated into protein number one. And so that's the process by which proteins are synthesized. Um, 
And uh, there are many, every single step in this process can be regulated by the cell so that you can decide, so the cell can decide exactly how much of protein number one it wants to make. Um, but a very important component of the regulation is to regulate this very first step where um, the information that's encoded in the DNA is being transcribed, as it's called, into the messenger RNA. And so let me um, uh, sort of emphasize this point um, a little bit. So if here's the DNA molecule, and here's the region that codes for the protein, and then I have my RNA polymerase that needs to walk along here, one way to regulate this process would be to have places along the DNA nearby where other proteins could bind. And those proteins are called transcription factors. And as you can tell from the, from the picture that I drew here, one thing that would be really easy would be to have a place where a protein could bind and just get in the way and stop the whole process. Slightly more subtly, you could imagine that a protein binds nearby. And by binding nearby, it makes it easier for this big green blob to find its place and get started in transcribing and eventually spitting out the messenger RNA. Now, this picture where you have transcription factors, TF, that bind to DNA, and of course they bind to specific sequence elements along the DNA, that's a, a long story, um, not particularly crucial here. Uh, this picture in which they bind very close to the beginning of where, um, uh, um, of where uh, transcription starts, that's very intuitive and says that, that somehow it's, it's, um, it, it's really this sort of direct physical proximity that allows for interactions. And um, if you thought that uh, this is um, approximately what happens in bacteria, it wouldn't be so terrible. That is to say, if you look in a bacterium and you ask how this process works, this cartoon isn't bad. The problem is that if you look in a big complicated animal like us, or the almost equally complicated fruit fly, which actually has almost the same number of genes that we do, you might wanna know that, um, and I tried to draw this to scale, then the, the, um, the place that's, that's coding for the protein would be over here. So I'm gonna change scale. And the places where um, the transcription factors can bind might be over here, or they might be over here, or in fact, they might be substantially off of the page. And nonetheless, those binding events somehow regulate um, the events that happen over here. So there's an enormous amount of, of territory along the DNA. Um, there's an enormous distance there, but of course, um, this is not a problem because really this all happens in three dimensions. And so you could imagine that what's really going on is that this is the part that codes for the protein and the binding of transcription factors that influence the process happens here. And it is the, there is physical proximity because these distances are in fact very short in three dimensions. So, and indeed, there are cases in bacteria that are something like this, where you have this sort of bending of the DNA molecule that brings the transcription factor and the, and the start of, transcription start site close together. Okay, and that of course raises all sorts of interesting questions about the sort of polymer physics of how the DNA moves around and everything else. So bracket, that's another interesting class of problems. Um, until recently, this was a story. Um, and uh, our experimentalist friends, um, many of whom are, are you know, real experimental physicists, 
uh, were frustrated by the, by the storytelling aspect of this. And um, what they've figured out how to do um, is, uh, let, me, let me talk about this, just think about it in terms of the piece of DNA. What you can do now is to take the tools of modern genetic engineering and introduce into the DNA little places wherever you, more or less where you want, where you put in particular sequences that proteins like, particular proteins like to bind to. And then what you do is you convince the same organism to make a protein, sorry, to make a protein which I've colored in green. And the reason I've colored it in green is that actually it is green. That is to say, if you shine light on it, it fluoresces back, fluoresces back at you in green. And so that means that when it binds, it lights up this particular place along the DNA. And you can engineer versions of this that also glow red. And what that means is that by building a microscope that uh, allows you to push past um, the diffraction limit, remember the scale of all this is, is very much submicron, um, you can directly visualize um, the distances among all these different sites. Okay. Now, obviously making this work experimentally is quite difficult, um, but um, what is now able to essentially take that cartoon picture and light up particular spots along the DNA. And then, for example, in a developing embryo where you have thousands of cells, you stop the action and then go in and look and measure the distances among all of these different little pieces, spots along the DNA um, uh, as the cell was doing its thing, right? And what we've learned is that this cartoon is wrong. That is to say, um, the, it is true that the sites which need to be in proximity come into proximity. Remember, the, the nucleus is, is, is many microns in size, and it's filled with DNA packaged in various complicated ways. And so there, you could be, and of course, if you stretch the DNA out, it would be meters long. So things which are far apart in sequence along the DNA could in principle be very far apart in three-dimensional space. And indeed, the things that need to be close together are unusually close together, but they're nowhere near in contact with each other. And so there's a problem in understanding how, um, we regul how cells regulate the reading out of genetic information, which is that the places where proteins bind and change the reading out are in some cases one or 200 nanometers away from the, from the action, right? And so this is the problem of action at a distance or parent action at a distance in, um, in the regulation of gene expression. And so how is it that, that this problem is resolved? Well, we've also learned in recent years that this whole region is filled With, um, with condensed droplets of protein, other proteins, not the ones we've been talking about, which sit around the place where uh, all this action is happening and not other places. So the question is whether it's possible for that droplet to act as a medium that could transmit information from these sites which are quite far apart. And so that's the idea that my colleagues and I have been thinking about. And um, the idea is, is reasonably straightforward. If you imagine that you have this uh, sort of blob, here's the DNA, there are the green places where proteins are going to bind. There's this red arrow, which is uh, what's called the promoter, the place where transcription is going to happen. So um, what are the things we need to keep track of inside the droplet, right? Again, the droplet is composed of 
of many different components. So there's obviously an order parameter that represents the condensation of the droplet out of the surrounding solution. Um, and again, these things are directly observed, right? And we know that they have fluid properties and so on. Um, so this is a, this part is not a speculation. On the other hand, we know very little about the, about the sort of internal fluctuations of this droplet and whether it has the ability to transmit information over long distances. So the idea is very simple. We imagine that there's some order parameter that describes things that are happening in the droplet, not presumably the order parameter which describes the condensation of the droplet itself. We can keep track of what's happening at all these green, at all these points where, um, where uh, transcription factor proteins could bind or not. Um, so the sites could be empty or occupied. And then at the, at the red arrow, you could imagine that the RNA polymerase molecule is either there and ready to go or not. So the promoter is either active or inactive. So what's the simplest model you could write down? You could say, well, there's some free energy that describes fluctuations of the order parameter in the droplet. The individual binding sites, they are either occupied or unoccupied. Um, one term in the free energy reflects the chemical potential of taking the protein out of solution and sticking it to the binding site. That's this one. And then um, the, we imagine that that also interacts with, um, with the medium of this droplet. And similarly, at the, at, the, um, prom at the promoter site, you're either active or inactive. Those two states differ by some free energy in the absence of any other signals. And then they, that switch between active and inactive also interacts with the local order parameter. And importantly, of course, all these interactions have to be spatially local. As usual, what you want to do is get rid of the fluctuations in the order parameter and think about an effective free energy for the degrees of freedom which are left over, which are these things which are kind of biologically functional, right? The binding and unbinding of transcription factors and the activity of the promoter. Okay, you go through the algebra and what do you find? What you find, and again, you, I mean, you can do more or less uh, sophisticated versions of this. Let me give the simplest one in which you imagine that all sites are approximately equidistant from one another. Um, and let's work in perturbation theory or alternatively in the approximation that the fluctuations of the order parameter are Gaussian. Well, then in that case, what you find is that um, all of these binding sites interact with each other with some strength that depends on the correlation function of the fluctuations. And similarly, all of these sites interact with the promoter, all these binding sites interact with the promoter, um, again, in a way that depends on the correlation function of the fluctuations. And so, um, the, uh, the picture is essentially that the fluctuations in the order parameter of this droplet are acting as a medium to transmit information among all the different binding sites. And, and that shows up in these couplings. So what does that do? Well, I mean, I, I'll save you the, 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 the details, which are sort of interesting if you want to, if, for reasons that connect more to the biology. Um, but let me just make a, a, a quick summary of these things. Um, it's interesting that in this family of models, because we have um, these terms, the binding of, uh, of transcription factor proteins at different binding sites is cooperative, even without changing the state of the promoter. This is subtly different from what happens in other classes of models that have been used in thinking about these kinds of problems in, in large biological molecules. So that's interesting. The difference between being a transcription factor that turns that turns uh, things on and turn things off is just the sign of the coupling constant. Um, and if you have a mix of activators and repressors, you get you can sort of build interesting logic elements. This is all fun, but maybe a little bit uh, off what I want to talk about today. Um, the important thing to remember is that because um, all of the it, uh, all of these things, all of these binding sites are interacting with each other through the medium of the um, of of the fluctuations in the droplet on the hypothesis that those fluctuations have correlations that extend over sufficiently long distances, then the free energy of the whole system is lowered by a term which is related to roughly the square of the number of binding sites, right? Because everything can interact if the correlations extend over sufficiently long distances, everything can interact with everything else. I'm being purposefully hand-waving here. Um, and that means, in some sense, that if the droplet had a chance to change its composition to lengthen the correlation length, 
there would be a gain in free energy. And so in that sense, there is for this finite droplet, a thermodynamic driving force toward longer correlation length. So why, does, why isn't, doesn't the correlation length then just automatically get long? Well, because the correlation length is determined by internal properties of the droplet. So for example, it's determined by the concentration of something, which I'll call X. And you could imagine that there's a critical point somewhere, but of course, that critical point is not at the concentration of this droplet, of, of this molecule in the surrounding solution, unless you believe in some immense fine tuning. But because the droplet is finite and there's lots of binding sites that can interact with each other in this combinatorial way, if the correlation length is long, then there's a term which pulls you, pulls the free energy down as the correlation length becomes long. And if the total number of molecules in the droplet is not too large, that can meaningfully compete with the, um, the, the op more obvious thermodynamic force that's holding the concentration near equilibrium with the surrounding. And so if you do a somewhat more sophisticated, a slightly more sophisticated calculation than what I'm doing here, what you find is that if you look at the free energy as a function of the concentration inside the droplet, you'll find that there's a minimum of the free energy when the uh, concentration inside the droplet is in equilibrium with the surrounding solution, which makes sense. But then because of this <clears throat> ability for of all the binding sites to interact with each other over long distances, you get another term <clears throat> which pulls the free energy down when the concentration inside the droplet um, approaches its critical value. And obviously the calculation that I'm sketching here is much too crude to get the details of this behavior right. But I think the, the spirit of it makes sense, which is that in a system where you have lots of things that are able to interact with each other through the medium, there is a thermodynamic force that would then drive the medium toward its critical point. And if the number, if that object is finite, then that can compete with the, more, with the, with the force that's holding it away from criticality by exchanging molecules with solution. So how do you test these ideas? Um, uh, my, our experimentalist friends are, are working hard on this at the moment. Um, let me, uh, basically the key idea is to go back to that, that notion of being able to measure distances and remember that if you, if you take the, the free energy, effective free energies that I wrote down seriously, you see that the free energy is, if, if the transcription factor binding, if the transcription factor binding happens and the um, transcription is activated, then that lowers the free energy. That's why activation occurs. But the amount by which it lowers the free energy depends on the distance between the two sites through the correlation function of the fluctuations. And so that means that when those, those things become aligned, as it were, um, then uh, they should be physically pulled together. And the strength of that pulling force is directly related to the strength of the interaction that is relevant for turning the system on. It's opposed by a stiffness of the whole blob, which is very hard to calculate, but you can see what it is because you can measure distances and you can measure their fluctuations. And if the system is in equilibrium and I measure the variance of the distances, I know what the stiffness is. And so you can put this together and realize that when you go from having the states of the transcription factor binding aligned versus anti-aligned with the state of the transcriptional apparatus itself, there should be a change in the mean distance whose scale is related to the fractional fluctuations and the thermodynamic strength of the interaction. Um, so this is a small but measurable uh, change in distance and also says that as it becomes possible to make these kinds of distance measurements, we should be thinking more carefully about how they relate um, to the thermodynamics of the functional interactions. So how do you do this? Well, there's this fantastic opportunity um, in, the, in the fly embryo. Um, this, is, this is the embryo of a fruit fly about three hours after the egg was laid and it's been stained so that certain proteins show up in green, other proteins show up in orange. Um, and what you see is that they form stripes. The thing that you don't know um, by looking at this picture is that this stripe, for instance, is turned on by some combination of transcription factors binding to one piece of the DNA, whereas this stripe is turned on same gene, 
but it's turned on by a different set of transcription factors binding to a different piece of the DNA. And so that means that by scanning across the embryo in space, you can see combinations where the, um, the transcription factors are bound or not bound, and the promoter is on or not on, and you can get all the combinations and see if the distances um, move in the way that they're supposed to. And obviously, I would, this isn't sort of ready for prime time, so I can't tell you. I don't think we know the answer as to whether it completely agrees with the theory or not, um, but I can tell you that this measurement is possible um, and that there are small but systematic differences of the sort that theory predicts. So this is one example um, of this idea of being near to criticality, and I think it's an interesting one um, because in this case, criticality would be the solution to a real problem, which is the apparent action at a distance in, in uh, the regulation of gene expression. And furthermore, in thinking about this, you uncover a mechanism for how the system could organize itself to being near the critical point, at least for these small finite droplets, um, which is interesting because it's a kind of purely thermodynamic mechanism. It's not the sort of um, uh, the kind of thing that, that um, we thought about with self-organized criticality uh, a generation ago. Um, it's just a consequence of the fact that these are strongly multi-component systems. And so um, you have this sort of competition between strengthening the interactions inside the droplet versus being in equilibrium uh, with, the, with the concentrations outside. And what that tells you is that, that maybe, maybe it's more general um, that droplets of material that have condensed out of solution in, in a living cell um, can be at surprising places in their phase diagram without fine tuning of the conditions in the surrounding. So that's a, I, think that's, I think that's a really interesting idea. I wanna take a few minutes um, to completely just, just before you, oh, just before you go on, there's a question in the chat. Ah, thank you. What is the length scale in the image? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the uh, um, the fly embryo is half a millimeter long, um, so the spacing between cells is uh, a few microns. Um, because these are stripes, and because this is a pattern forming system, you might think about sort of various non-equilibrium pattern formation mechanisms where you get an instability that, that gives rise to periodic patterns. That's a fantastic idea, but it turns out that's not what's going on because when the mother lays the egg, she actually breaks the translational symmetry by putting uh, particular molecules at cardinal points. Um, and so this is much more of a sort of unfolding of the information that's placed by the mother in a sort of Freudian way. Um, uh, uh, rather than a kind of instability out of a homogeneous state as, as Turing imagined. There are examples of those instabilities being very relevant for, for pattern formation, um, but uh, that's, that's not how you should think about this one. Okay. And the things that I've been talking about are all happening inside the nuclei of the individual cells that you see here, right? So this is zooming out to emphasize that different cells are doing different things. And the fact that you can see all of that in, in, in one embryo means that you can, in a sense, nature has given you a controlled experimental chamber, which is the embryo itself, in which you can compare different cells which are in different states with respect to all the variables that we've been talking about. And you can measure what, uh, what all those distances are. It's really quite an astonishing um, experimental opportunity. Uh, it's also interesting Parenthetically, as you think about how disciplines relate to each other and things like that, um, you know, from an experimental point of view, uh, the frontier here is being able to combine tools that come from molecular biology with really the frontier of your ability to do light microscopy. Um, so it's, it, it's really, you, you can't get this right. You can't do this unless you can do both the physics and the biology. So it's interesting. Um, okay, let me take a few minutes and talk about a very different problem. Um, which is the problem of activity in large populations of neurons. So um, this is something that, that, that we've been excited about um, for some time and recently uh, uh, had a, a step forward. Um, the experimental setup, uh, there are two ways of recording electrical activity in the brain. One is you stick in a wire and pick up the electrical signal directly. The other is you genetically engineer the animal so that it makes a fluorescent protein that lives inside all of its cells in the brain and, or some selected subset of them. And the fluorescence is sensitive 
to the electrical activity of the cell, um, typically because it's sensitive to the calcium concentration. So this is an experiment from my colleague, uh, David Tank, of the second flavor. Here is the little mouse that has been genetically engineered. Um, the rest of all this is um, a large microscope that makes it possible to see into the brain and, and, and look at individual neurons, in fact, with resolution much better than the size of single cells because you have to be able to tell them apart and they're densely packed. If you want to do that, um, it's very hard to have the animal moving around um, because then you'd have to do, you know, uh, diffraction limited microscopy in a sample that was, that was literally moving around of its own volition. Um, that's hard. So one alternative is to hold down the mouse's head so that you can build this big microscope that sits above him, but then leave him free to run around um, on this styrofoam ball, which is suspended on a column of air. Um, there's then another kind of mouse sitting over here, um, which monitors the rotation of the ball. And by monitoring the rotation of the ball, you can compute what path the animal would have taken if it were running freely. And then you can project um, into the world around him what he would have seen if he had taken that path. So you've built virtual reality for the mouse. Um, and that's important because many interesting things that happen in the brain only happen in the animals actually moving around in an environment. The signals that you get in this way are incredibly clean. Um, you see, this is the fluorescence from a, sig from a single uh, neuron. And what you see is that most of the time the fluorescence signal really is zero. And then occasionally you get a little burst that you could call um, a one instead of a zero, or you could take the continuous signal more literally. So what we'd like to do is to ask something about the distribution of all of this activity, right? Where I can imagine writing down, for instance, the joint probability distribution of the states of all of the neurons. Where is that probability distribution in the, in the phase diagram of possible distributions? And one way of approaching this question is to try and use ideas from the normalization group. So let's imagine that we, one way to diagnose this from the data, right? Remember, we don't really know what the underlying model is. Um, one way to diagnose this from the data would be to um, coarse grain, right? And ask how do coarse grain variables behave as we change the scale of our coarse graining? Um, great question about 3D imaging. The particular region of the brain which is studied in these experiments, this is the, the cognoscenti, this is region CA1 of the hippocampus, is a single, is almost all the cells are in a single layer. And so that means that if you can find your way down, if you can push things out of the way and, and find your way down to that layer, you can hold in one plane of focus and everything's fine. There are obviously more sophisticated. So another alternative is to only study the cells that are on the surface, as is suggested in the, in the question. And there are yet more sophisticated things um, where you either scan your plane of focus up and down or use or steer beams so that the focus is at a place that can be adjusted in 3D. Um, this particular set of experiments is done with two photon excitation of the fluorescent molecules. Again, nice physics in the background. Um, and uh, uh, as a result, um, you, you, know, you can use this trick of, of uh, your, your imaging is only sensitive to places where the intensity is very, very high, right? So um, you can arrange, right, you have a pulse laser, you can arrange that the pulses only arrive jointly with high intensity at particular places in 3D, and you can scan, okay? Um, so the answer is there are limitations to doing everything fully in 3D, but the, some, th some things are possible and the frontier is moving rapidly. So what I'd like to do is to take these data and somehow do coarse graining and see, you know, can I find, uh, some simple behaviors of uh, the, the coarse grain patterns of activity. Today, you can record simultaneously from thousands of neurons. Um, and so we actually have some space to do this kind of coarse graining. The problem, of course, is that neurons are large extended objects and interact with each other over long distances. And so it's not the case that you only want to average with your neighbor. So an alternative is to compute the correlations among the activities of all the neurons and say that your neighbor is the cell with which you are most strongly correlated. And so that defines neighborhood relationships. And now you can coarse grain in ways that you're familiar with, right? 
So, um, so that's what you do. You look at the patterns of activity, you find the most correlated pair, the next most correlated pair, and so on. You average those together, um, and you can now iterate this. And this all proceeds in ways that are familiar. How do you follow what's happening? Well, you do exactly what you would do in a Monte Carlo simulation. You follow the statistics of the coarse grain variables themselves, which is an idea that goes back uh, to the early days, right? So for instance, if I think about this coarse grained variable, um, it could be zero. Remember that, that the neurons are, are truly silent much of the time. And if it's not zero, then it has some non-trivial distribution. And um, if you ask yourself, well, what happens? If, if the neurons were all independent of each other, then you would expect that the probability of, of getting a zero would just fall exponentially because you're asking that neuron one, that, that, you know, that all K of the variables in the coarse-grained cluster are, are silent, right? So the probabilities multiply, you'd expect it to fall exponentially. And it turns out that it doesn't quite fall exponentially, um, but it does fall as e to the minus K to a power but the power is anomalous. And if you look at the probability distribution of the coarse grain variables, you see that as you start to coarse grain more and more, and so this is going from looking at the, the um, distribution over individual variables to um, coarse graining over hundreds of variables, hundreds of neurons, you see that the probability distribution is essentially approaching a fixed form. Let me emphasize that one of the things that is a fundamental obstacle to theoretical physicists thinking about biological systems is the feeling that experiments are a bit noisy and irreproducible. And so I would note that when we tried to estimate this scaling exponent um, in experiments on three completely different animals, totally independent of each other, um, we find that the error bars across experiments um, are essentially equal to the error bars um, of estimation in a single experiment. And furthermore, um, you'll notice that the error bar itself is in the second decimal place of the, um, of the, of the exponent. Um, so we don't know yet whether these exponents are in any sense universal, but at least we know that they're reproducible, which is sort of a prerequisite for imagining that someday there will be a theory. Well, one can say more about all this. Um, I'm particularly fascinated by the fact that you can see dynamic scaling. That is to say, even though we have this funny coarse graining procedure, it really is true that the correlation functions of the coarse grain variables um, stay with the same form as you change the scale of your coarse graining. And all that happens is that you get um, a, time, a single time scale, um, which grows as a power of your cluster size. What I've described here of, of coarse graining by putting together neurons that are maximally correlated is an analog of real space normalization, if you want. Um, you can also think about trying to do things in momentum space. The analog here of momentum space is to look at the structure of the correlation matrix and diagonalize it. Of course, in a system with translation invariance, that is going to momentum space. In a system without translation invariance, it's going into some other space. And you can reproduce all of these behaviors there. They don't have time to talk about, but this is described in, in the papers that, that I cited. And so let me um, take a moment um, to wrap up. I've shown you, so the, the spirit of this is to ask, are there, are there um, uh, interesting things to say about um, the appearance of critical like phenomena in the biological context. Um, there are hints out there from many different systems. There are numerous problems with, with each of those examples. I've shown you two new approaches to this. In the context of neurons, which is in some sense an old, an example people have been chewing on um, for uh, 15 or more years, um, I think this idea of trying to take notions from coarse graining and the normalization group and use them directly in the analysis of data on these systems is, is, is really fascinating. And I'm, we were really surprised that sort of in our first pass through the data, we found sort of all the things you might have hoped for, right? We find scaling behaviors, we find probability distributions that seem to approach fixed forms that aren't Gaussian, all the good things, right? And of course, we've spent an enormous amount of time trying to convince ourselves that we're not just fooling ourselves in, in some subtle way. We don't think we are. Um, and we think that this phenomenology is getting solid enough that, that it starts to pose some sharp theoretical questions. In the other example, um, which is much more recent, um, thinking about the problem of, of apparent action at a distance in the regulation of gene expression, there are these droplets that condense throughout cells and do all sorts of interesting things. People haven't thought so much about what the where those droplets are 
in their phase diagram. And what we see is that if they are near um, to a critical point, then that can resolve the, the real problem of apparent action at a distance in these systems. Um, essentially, the long range correlations and fluctuations provide a medium for exchanging information. Um, and along the way, we, we notice that there is a mechanism, which is a purely thermodynamic mechanism, for these systems to organize themselves to a critical point, or at least close to a critical point, without having to fine tune their environment. And um, if that seems like an interesting possibility, we don't know whether it's right, but we also see that there's a way of testing some of these ideas by using this incredible new ability that our experimentalist friends have to measure um, the distances among all the different components of the system at, um, at really tens of nanometer resolution. So that was a little bit too long. So let me, uh, let me stop there and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bill. So, Piers, okay. you run the questions? Okay, I'll run the questions, Jose. Yes, okay, time for questions. Um, let's see, did we get to the one by uh, Timotus Tuda? Uh, I think so, I think so. Okay, so can you read that or shall I read it out? Can you uh, so this was the question about, about uh, whether you only look on the surface or can, can look through in 3D, and, and I, I said what I know about that. I could say it again, but... Um, All right, very good. Uh, Premi has a question. Oh, hi, Bill. Uh, very hi, nice you. talk. Um, uh, I unfortunately came late, so you may have covered this already, but to many of us, when we hear about droplets, we start thinking about liquid, uh, liquid gas transition, mm -hmm. which is, of course, and we think, and, and we think about uh, first order. Uh, yeah. How did you? How do we know that there's a critical point, and not that we have coexistence and nucleation and stuff like that? Um, so, uh, particularly in a so, there's two there's two questions here. One is um, the fact that the droplets condense out at all is presumably you should think first order, right? right. By the way, um, when people started to see these, there was this immediate leaps, oh, this is liquid liquid phase separation. I know how this all works, everything else. You don't often see these things actually coarsening inside of cells, which should bother you. I see. So I think actually the formation of the droplet although it clearly is in the spirit of the liquid, of the kinds of phase separations that we understand, my guess is that there's more control being exerted over this than, than has, been, has been fully understood. So in particular, if you reconstitute systems um, with small numbers of, of the essential components, then those things do exactly what you would have expected and they don't look like what you see in the cell. Okay. Um, so, that's, so that's about the formation of the droplet. Then with respect to the sort of remaining degrees of freedom in the droplet, um, as you know, right, if I, take a finite, if I take a finite droplet and I do things at the surface and I'm close to a first order transition, I can also get communication over long distances because things at the surface can flip the whole state. We think that that actually wouldn't explain some important features of the regulation of gene expression because um, you need to be able to get something that's graded. Um, but we could be wrong about that. So well, there is an alternative. Sir, sir well, what do you mean so, by graded? Well, so, so you can, as you change the concentration of transcription factors, you also, you can get um, continuous changes in the activity, in the amount of, of uh, the expression of the activity of the yes, transcription. Perfect. And that's a little harder to do in a first order scenario. Yeah, although, you know, if it turned out that, that, that the way it really works is that, that we're close to a first order transition and that's why, I, I don't know that I'd be, it's not quite as elegant as if we're near a yes, real critical point, but um, I mean, we're talking about finite droplets, so you should be a little careful uh, about, about being too, too picky. Um, I think the idea that, that in order to understand what's going on, you need to be at a non-generic place in the phase diagram. I think that, that seems to be right. Um, and so exactly with the nature of that point, we picked the, we picked the interesting alternative as a, as a straw man. And if we end up sliding to something a little bit less interesting, that would be okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
John Miller has a question. Hi, yes. Uh, so this also, <clears throat> excuse me, has something to do with the, um, when you're talking about gene expression, uh, in the actual, if I understand correctly, in the actual uh, the DNA within the nucleus, it spends a, a great portion of its time in this very complex ordered structure you know, called the chromatin, which I, I'm sure you're yes. familiar, familiar with. And I think if I understand correctly, that during the process of transcription, that parts of it have to, I think they call it chromatin remodeling, where yeah. Yeah, parts yeah. of the thing have to open up so that uh, you can actually then transcribe uh, into a uh, Definitely. RNA. <laughs> Excuse me. And so I was wondering if you could comment whether, uh, you know, whether you've tried to start looking in, looking into that uh, from a physics uh, point of view, and then what would be the role? Well, there is a there is a community, a substantial community that worries about this. Um, uh, I mean, one of the one of the issues is that that you know, cells do many things over the course of their lives. Um, and so uh, different parts of your genome have to be in different states during different parts of life. Um, and so uh, you sort of can't get this discussion started. If everything's all tightly wrapped up, then which is, you know, I mean, how that works is a, is a great problem. Um, after all, you know, you are putting meters worth of stuff into microns worth of space, um, which, you know, you could argue is maybe more interesting than the thing that I talked about. Um, uh, then uh, if you are completely wrapped up, obviously you, you can't get this whole process started. And so there has to be a certain amount of opening. Um, now, the experiments that I was referring to um, are done in the very early stages of embryonic development, which might be special, and thus you have to worry about whether things are general there. On the other hand, that's a period of enormous activity of all of these processes. And so uh, thing, you know, the things that need to be open are open. Um, so you don't, you don't have to worry about that step. Um, I think a lot of people try to, um, you sort of separate. Um, so, so for instance, if you wanna understand how you turn something off and keep it off, you might think that that's a problem because you have to make a protein that binds and represses things and everything else. But of course, if you can package it all up and close everything, then that could be stable for a, for a time scale, which just has nothing to do with any of the other time scales. So there are places where that's absolutely crucial to understanding what's going on. Um, but but in these examples, for instance, where you have a, a collection of cells, um, which are all more or less in the same state, in this sort of global sense, but then um, you know this cell has turned this gene on and this gene off, and the cell next to it's got it the other way. And that's the result of these very particular transcription factor signals. That's the process that we're that we're trying to focus on. I don't know if there's time for me to ask uh, one follow up or not. Go ahead, Go ahead John. Yeah. Okay, uh, the, this is actually a kind of a slightly a little bit different topic, but uh, I was wondering if you're uh, either you or your colleagues have looked into this debate. You know, there is a debate in biology about how much of the non-coding RNA are actually uh, you know, serving a useful fu regulatory function as opposed to just being complete junk. And, you know, even here at U of H, uh, we have uh, people on opposite sides of the fence. Uh, you know, one person that they say treasure in the trash, you know, that these non-coding RNAs are really critical for, you know, from a regulatory point of view. And then another person says, no, most of it's just complete junk. And so I'm just wondering whether uh, anybody has started to look at that maybe a little bit more from a physics, uh, biophysics perspective. So it's not a literature I know very well. I, I my own prejudice, having studied a lot of systems uh, that exhibit extraordinary precision and efficiency, um, I get very nervous when people declare that they know that something that they find in a living system was junk. Um, that, that, <laughs> By the way, it, 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 it was biologists who did that, not physicists. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Despite, despite the usual characterization of who, who has arrogance in approaching these problems. Um, I can add a comment. To yeah, that. just like you've thought about this. So, so I, you know, I, I think I, my prejudice would be to look for functions of things. By the way, if you look at, at, the, at the genes that code for proteins in the best studied bacteria, one third of them, we know they code for a protein, we don't know what the protein does. Mm 
Oh yeah, I guess that's right. Yeah. So just as a as a, as a calibration oh, point, was, yeah. For for you know whether you should trust the declaration that something is useless. So just a fast comment. I think there is a lot of what you'd call quasi junk, and it's not really junk. It's left over from evolution genes that exist before and that are not genes anymore. So there is some stuff left in there. But there's a lot of stuff of regulatory work done by RNA that we're just discovering all the time, right? Basically, if you talk about 10 years ago, nobody will tell you about microRNAs. And now we know the microRNAs play a major role. And all these things are encoded on what people use in the past to call junk. So I think what you're figuring out is there is some leftover just because uh, during evolution, some stuff got used and some stuff didn't get used. But there's a lot of stuff we just don't know about it. There's a lot of regulation of RNA that we're just learned. And microRNA is a great case that basically a few years ago we had no idea about it. Now they play a major role in controlling many of the controlling, particularly in things involved on cancers and stuff like that. It's also it's also worth remembering, right? If you even if you think about something that codes for a protein and you think about the structure of the protein itself at the risk of, of saying this in front of people who are more expert than I am. You know, you, you might want to emphasize that, you know, you have some structure and, and you know, what was, what was functionally important was to bring these two things together. And out here you have a loop that, and here you have a loop, right? And it's important that these two things come together. It may not be important which amino acids are actually sitting here. On the other hand, it is important that this whole structure be long enough that these come together in the right way. So I could, for example, do an experiment in which I randomly replace these amino acids with something else. And I would discover that nothing changes. So what would I conclude? I would conclude I was thinking about it the wrong way, right? It's not that, it's not that these amino acids are junk and these are functional. I mean, if, if you chop out too much of this, it doesn't work. Right. On the other hand, you can replace it with something that's almost random and it would still work. So I, I think it's hard to, yeah, the declaration that something's not important is challenging. Bill, can I ask a question? I wanted Please. to ask you about your, uh, sca your scaling work on neuron. Uh, you, you've used the the criteria that the ones with the closest correlations are that are the ones that you use yeah. for screening. Aren't you worried that that might bias in some ways the the underlying results you're getting? So yes, I'm sorry. Yes, we're worried. Um, so now the question is, what's a what's a meaningful check? Um, so uh, the first worry. So a lot of as, as the dimensionality of the data sets that people collect on biological systems has grown, the, the, so, the length of the data sets has of course not grown in proportion. Mm. And so the opportunities for chasing meaningless correlations have grown, um, well, not exponentially, but perhaps quadratically, um, right? So you know, if, I wanna measure, if I wanna measure the covariance matrix of a d-dimensional vector, I need a number of samples, which is vastly larger than D. Mm. And so at some point, I'm, by trying to look at correlations, I'm gonna get in trouble, mm. right? So that, that problem is out there. That's easy to check, right? You can generate surrogate data sets that, that, um, that don't have any real underlying correlations and, and make sure that, that that's not what's driving your behavior and so on. Mm -hmm. um, more subtly, um, you might worry that anything that reproduces this sort of correlation behavior would automatically generate these results. And that's not true. Mm -hmm. um, so you can generate surrogate data sets for that. You can also generate, um, the, you can look at the behaviors of generic model networks. You can look at the behaviors of networks that have properties that are very tightly tied to the behavior of this particular network, which has a number of special features that we could talk about that maybe isn't so relevant. Um, so we have a whole series of things that, that you know, uh, some pseudo data that you can generate um, that uh, um, uh, is, that 
that don't do these kinds of scale, don't generate these kinds of scaling behaviors. Right. So we think that um, we're not, as I say, I don't think we're fooling ourselves in any obvious way. Whether, whether we, we, as you might guess, since what I've described actually is quite simple, most of the effort is involved in convincing yourself that, that you're not doing something wrong. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so we think that this is, this is pretty solid. Although again, you know, you see, you know, you're in a finite size system, you see scaling over some finite range. I mean, it's the full range that we can access, but, but it's limited. Would there be a way of checking whether in some cases that the neurons that are closely correlated are actually physically connected somehow? Ah, uh, so yes, in some cases that, that will be possible. Um, there's also interesting questions about um, whether they are in fact spatially proximate to one another. Mm -hmm. um, again, this is a region of the brain in which there are longstanding controversies about, um, about the importance of spatial locality and the connectivity and so on. So yes, I mean, there's a, that also that's happening right in parallel for those of you who don't know about this. Um, there's this whole world of connectomics of being able to take small regions of the brain and, and map the connections among all of the many neurons that, that are in that region. Uh, again, that's been something that, that a number of people from the physics community right. have been active in, both in developing the physical measurement techniques and in developing the algorithmic techniques to, 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 to do the three-dimensional reconstruction. Well, I don't see any more questions up there, so I think it's a good time to thank Bill for this amazing, very broadly ranging talk. Um, and thank you for coming and bringing us a today on these new developments. They're fantastic. Great. Let's thank our, our microphone just to thank Bill. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. Nice to see all of you. Yeah, great. Good to see everyone. Thank you. And in fact, uh, that brings our three Hello, thanks. Yeah, great. Brings our three day summit to an end. Um, we're going to be posting all of these videos online um, if there's no objections. Are you okay with that, Bill? Yes, of course. Okay, thank yeah. you. Good. Um, and uh, we, we have a lot of opportunity to continue the dialogues uh, uh, in between all of us by email and other methods. Um, uh, in fact, Rajiv, we might want to think about posting a list of participants for those who agree to doing that. Yeah. Anyway, so thank we you. Have a list. And uh, I hope to see you all very, very soon. Bye-bye, then. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thank everybody. Thank you very much, Piers.